I'm here with my friend Mark Sudek, who is the director of the program in historical performance at the Peabody Conservatory of Johns Hopkins University. You probably know Mark as a really distinguished player of plucked instruments. He's a member of the Baltimore Consort. Of, he's played everything and done everything and performed with everybody you know. Um, he, I think, has affected as many people in early music in North America as any other living human being through his work um, at the Interlochen, uh, Interlochen for many years. And he now, and actually since quite some time, um, is on the faculty at Peabody and directs the program in historical performance there. And I'm really happy to see you, Mark. I was Thomas, great to see the program, but this isn't a TV program. It's just a, just a chat for us to... Um, uh, we're looking around just to try to find out what we think about the place of historical performance in higher education and what its future is. So I don't know any thoughts you have, but what can you tell us a little bit? We can we can see websites and stuff like that. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your program at um, at Peabody? Uh, interesting to me is how. Uh, historical performance fits into a major conservatory associated with, but not completely inside of, a major research university in a major American city. Okay, well, hi, Tom, and <laughs> it's great to see you and talk to you as usual. Uh, and uh, I want to make one correction, though. Uh, I stepped down as chair of the department this year. Oh. Wonderful timing on my part, I must say. And John Moran is now the interim chair of uh, historical per performance at Peabody. But I was for about 15 years and have been on the faculty at Peabody for I'm in my 35th year now. Uh, one to go. <laughs> so, uh, so, well, uh, early music historical performance at the Peabody Conservatory. Uh, we have a uh, uh, undergraduate, masters, and, D and and a new DMA program, uh, and we also have a collaborative program with uh, vocal studies, where the students can get degrees in HP as singers as well. So it's it's a a, a pretty strong program, broad. Uh, the focus is primarily Baroque and pre-Baroque music. We do have a lot of pre-Baroque offerings. I'm proud to say. Uh, because uh, I know a lot of schools don't. Uh, I'd love to tell you how great we are in terms of the framework of the conservatory. And I, I hope HP is doing better on the state university level, because it's not doing that well at the conservatory. Uh, our dean is truly remarkable, Fred Bronstein. He's, he's done some great things, innovative things at Peabody. He has these pillars that all the curriculum are based on, you know, excellence, of course, and interdisciplinary, uh, community connectivity, uh, innovation, and diversity. And uh, diversity is, has always been a tough one for classical music and especially for HP. But, you know, of course, we're working on that. But the other pillars are are generally, he's talking about things that early musicians have always had to do, you know, and, and the classical music mainstream is, is like catching up to us, you know, reaching out to the community. My God, what, what an idea. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Uh, so we've always done these things. Uh, but the whole idea of innovative curriculum and in, interdisciplinary uh, throughout two years of task forces, committees, and subcommittees, we put together a curriculum where every committee member was really strong on uh, including historical performance, like the, even the orchestral program was going to have uh, students doing a three-week or four-week session, you know, with coaches from our department. And a lot of great things came about through these task forces and committees and but uh, the bottom line was we kind of got left out of the picture. So, you know, there's a lot of talk, you know, and, and when the Dean speaks about uh, curriculum, when he speaks to the students, he's certainly very pro historical performance, but there's nothing uh, on the books saying kids will do this for a certain amount of time. So our department 
as wonderful as it is, it's as marginalized as it has ever been. And, you know, we're our own little small family. You know, we love being together. And in, in one sense, it's nice being outside of the, the main conservatory. We're, we're not on anyone's radar screen. But we have the use of these terrific facilities. We have wonderful concert halls and uh, get to perform in them on a regular basis. We still, you know, are a functioning ensemble in the conservatory hierarchy. So. Sure. Well, I'm, uh, a thing I'm really interested in is in the extent to which you permeate. I'm really, really pleased to know that you have that arrangement with the vocal arts, with the singing people. Um, but are, is it possible to learn an early music uh, after arriving at Peabody? I mean, I know that, uh, that unless you go to Interlochen, it's not many high school musicians learn early music in high school. Yeah. They learn to learn it at the college or university level. So I wonder how they get into your program and whether there's a certain amount of secondary teaching or people who are switch hitters while they're there or people who come to you once the scales fall from their eyes and they see that the Baroque violin is the real violin. How does that work? Well, uh, I'll tell you, what. Uh, we have two really terrific, we have three terrific recorder players in my ensemble, the Renaissance Ensemble. Uh, they play Baroque recorders. One of them is a, a Baroque recorder major. The other one is a French horn major and a music education double major. But she happened to win the Pifaro competition for high school recorder players uh, five years ago. She's uh, a junior now at Peabody. She's an absolutely phenomenal recorder player. And I have a, a third player who is a, an applied physics major at Johns Hopkins University, and he's doing a double major at Peabody in composition. I have one lute major this year, an, uh, an undergrad who's a senior this year. He started as a tuba major, and he came to my uh, Renaissance Ensemble concert in December of his freshman year and absolutely fell in love and came up to me afterwards and said, I've played a lot of electric guitar. Do you think I could maybe study the lute? And he became a lute minor and in his junior year uh, auditioned for our department and was accepted enthusiastically and unanimously by our faculty. And he's a, a terrific lutenist and is on his way probably to Basel next year for graduate studies. So yes, uh, at Peabody, you can. It's, they don't make it easy for you because it involves taking an, uh, often involves taking an overload credit wise and they're they strongly uh, uh, advise against that because they want all the students you know to to have normal loads and not be overtaxed so it, it's sometimes it's hard and sometimes you know they there are extra fees involved with studying secondary instrument but there, we offer lots of classes in our department that are open to anyone in the conservatory or the university. But there's not a, I mean, there's not a big program of, of uh, secondary instruction that keeps the department boiling. It's no, there isn't. And that's primarily because there's a charge for secondary studies. But the Baroque Orchestra that we have generally has about 16 to 20 members. And more than half of them are non-HP majors. Do, so they, they, do they need to study some Baroque violin or Baroque strings or whatever before they can get into the orchestra? Yeah, what we have is we have a beginning Baroque violin class, or beginning Baroque viola class, beginning Baroque cello class. And the kids take that. Uh, it, it frequently turns into one-to-one -one sessions with the kids because there usually aren't more than four or five kids in, in these classes. And then they're gradually uh, moved up into the orchestra as they're capable. And I mean, we get some phenomenal violinists, so they, they get pretty capable pretty quickly. Sure, yeah. Wow. So um, it's interesting that you're in the, you're in a sort of a big metropolitan area. I mean, you operate, you're between Washington and New York, and I know that some of your faculty are very active in Philadelphia. Yeah, it probably means that you have access to a great number of talented uh, people for your faculty. I don't know whether you, how how the people who are teaching there how it operates. I presume that there's a small number of full time faculty and a somewhat larger number of either part time or adjunct or however Peabody organizes it. 
That's right. We only have two full-time faculty members, myself and uh, Adam Pearl, our harpsichord teacher, who also directs Baroque opera. And we're doing semile as, as I speak. Uh, and then several adjunct uh, members, John Moran and Risa Browder come up from Arlington, Virginia. Meg Owens sometimes comes up. I think she's also in Arlington or maybe Fairfax, Virginia. And then uh, Richard Stone and Gwen Roberts come down from Philadelphia. So that, those, that's the core of our faculty. And the voice teachers, uh, Bill Sharp is on our faculty. And Ayang Hong uh, is a phenomenal singer and uh, primarily doing contemporary music these days, but has done lots and lots of uh, Baroque music and is a, a great uh, uh, teacher, not only of the style, but of technique. Wow. Uh, so uh, somebody who wanted to play some other kind of instrument, wanted to learn natural trumpet or natural horn or uh, Baroque bassoon or whatever, what would that, what would that student do? That's a little trickier. Baroque bassoon, uh, we have a bassoon faculty member that has played and is willing to give a couple of lessons uh, to bassoon majors to get them started but is not a Baroque bassoon specialist. So uh, he, get, he gets some to the point that they can you know, play in the orchestra. Uh -huh. yeah. And we don't have any early brass. We have some interested faculty members and some new faculty members, uh, including oboe, uh, modern faculty, modern oboe teachers that are much more open to their students doing Baroque oboe than they have in the past. Uh, trombone teach we have a bunch of sack butts and occasionally we get a trombone major that uh plays has already played some sack but as an undergrad maybe and mm -hmm. and plays with us we had one last year and i've had uh, two or three over the last 10 years maybe but we don't have like a sack butt ensemble no but there's um, there's a, uh, seems to me a certain amount of crossover anyway i remember going to a a wonderful flute class in which all the modern flutists came in to be coached in hp if and each one of them played a movement of a of a Bach sonata and was yeah. very beautifully, and they learned an awful lot. It seemed to me. Yeah, that's one of our beginning Baroque instrument classes. They uh, uh, that has so many people uh, in it. It's such a popular class that Gwen Roberts, who teaches it, lets them uh, coaches them on style on their modern flutes, and then a, a few of them will will play on Baroque flute, but they have that option. That seems to me a, a, a very worthy thing for modern flutists to do. I don't know, to learn something about the style. If they're going to play box sonatas, they might as well learn something about how, anyway. But yeah. th that there's a philosophical question in that about whether musicians should be switch hitters and whether you should be encouraging people to play both or to play our music on their instruments and all that sort of thing. But it sounds as though it sounds as though you've, you've struck an interesting sort of balance that doesn't insert you very strongly into the mainstream of what goes on at the at the at the conservatory. Is that right? I would say so. You know, the exception is in voice, because when we generally do a Baroque opera every other year and the auditions are completely open for that. We try to make sure that if there's an HP voice major that he or she has a role, it yeah. might be a very minor role depending on who, uh, who else auditions. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get a 20 or 30 auditions of people from outside of our department for that. So there's a there's much more cohesiveness uh, in collaboration with the voice department. We also have a new director of choral studies, Beth Willer, uh, Lorelei Ensemble. She directs that, she, and she is just phenomenal. And she's very very interested in early music. And actually, I just realized I saw you in one of her classes last yeah, last fall. She was trying to run the chorus uh, at a distance. I mean, I don't know how you do that, but I had the pleasure of talking to them about medieval music. And I admired so much the fact that she wanted her chorus to hear about those things. Yeah. Yeah. And she had Scott Metcalf do a couple of presentations also. And mm -hmm. yeah, we're in, we're in touch regularly. And uh, her and John Moran and I have set up uh, a meeting to talk about uh, vocal studies and HP uh, in, in the future. So it sounds like a lot of what happens is not uh, I don't want to say it's, it's not organized by the conservatory. It has to do with 
yeah. working in people that you know and things that would be helpful to the students. You know where to, you know whom to ask if you want this or that or the other thing. And people are willing to reach out and help each other, even though the if you read the book about the conservatory, you would not know that any of this was going on or was a possibility. Yeah, yeah. Sadly, it's not top down, but it's just individual fact mo quote modern instrument fat and voice faculty uh have varying degrees of what they what they want their students to participate in and so we we try to uh cultivate relationships with the ones that want their students to be a little broader in their in their so, backgrounds uh, mark you've been around long enough to be able to be a little bit philosophical and we should pay attention to what you think what do you think what do you think about the place of uh, historical performance in higher education? I say that because of a couple of things. One is that for a long time, people got into early music and advanced in early music, not through higher education, but through the whole alternative network of summer workshops and European music schools and private teachers and things like that. That's one aspect. And another aspect is that, that um, the institutionalization of early music in, in uh, important programs like yours and others, uh, some people feel is kind of against the spirit of early music, which originally was kind of based on discovery, figuring it out for yourself and all that kind of thing. Whereas now you can just go to a conservatory and your teacher will tell you what to do when you do it, which is, not the way we do things in early music and yet yeah. and yet uh institute the, the good institutions of higher education have all felt somehow that the historical performance is uh needs to be a part of their institution so what do you think is the role of historical performance in higher education well i think historical performance can and should be a huge part of a musician's general education. I mean, I mean, let's face it, the classical, the audience for classical music is not getting bigger. Uh, and it's going to be a huge challenge, especially with COVID to come back and rebuild our audience. Uh, our audience is white, and it's aging. Uh, and we're not going to do it with the this, this same approach. And early music, I think is so much more accessible to a normal listener who's not experienced, uh, then is you know, going to hear the symphony play a Brahms symphony or a Tchaikovsky symphony. In my opinion, I, I think it's much more fun to hear someone do the Vivaldi Four Seasons, uh, despite the fact that that's been played to death, but I don't care. I, I, I'll go to hear it if there's a good violinist playing it. Uh, and they've got some guitars and lutes in the in the continuous section. But and just even that I, I joke about that. But just seeing a Baroque guitar, you know, they're probably in an audience of uh, several hundred people There are probably 20, 30, 40 people in that room that have played the guitar. And to see uh, that instrument as part of this quote classical music experience, you know, makes it a little bit more meaningful for them. And that's just one tiny example, but there are so many elements of Baroque music and, and even pre Baroque music that can bring audiences in. Uh, also, the fact that, you know, our orchestras are small. You know they're they're easier to maintain than a modern philharmonic orchestra. You know there's that, and budget is on everyone's mind right now more so than ever. So it's uh, I think it's more important than it ever has been because, you know, diversity is more important than it ever has been. Finally. Yeah. So what do you think? A, what do you think a young person anticipating a career? in early music that would inevitably involve some teaching and maybe teaching in or being involved somehow in higher education how would such a person prepare herself for a for a future profession in life well i would say they have a, a bunch of challenges ahead of them they have to learn to uh, collaborate they have to learn to innovate i think they need to learn to work with other art forms uh, 
a problem I have with HP in general in this country is there's just so much preaching to the choir. We need to look outside of ourselves. Uh, I see nothing wrong with collaborating with people that play uh, non HP instruments, you know, if, if there are balance issues are, that are worked out. I love the fact that some early musicians are playing with musicians that are doing non Western music and using non Western instruments and that that blend of, of sounds. So there's, uh, I myself uh, have done loads of collaboration right now I'm working with an author putting together a program called The Secret Music at Tordesillas. I don't know if you've heard of that book. It's a, a pretty recent work of historical fiction by Marjorie Shondor. And it is an absolutely stunningly beautiful book, uh, my favorite book of, of the moment. And it's historical fiction based on the uh, kind of uh, imprisonment of the queen, Joan the Mad, the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella. And Marjorie uh, is a musician herself. She's fascinated by the music of this period, uh, was made aware of it uh, in someone's apartment who was playing a La Nef recording of uh, songs of Joan the Mad. And uh, uh, she's a, a, a creative writer, teaches, is a professor of creative writing at the University of uh, State, Un Oregon State University, sorry. Anyway, she's researched the composers of that period really well, brings them to life. Juan de Lencina is one of the characters in this story. Wow. And so we're going to do a, a, a program with her at the Indianapolis Early Music Festival next year, where she'll be doing narrations in between sets of music, and we'll pick out pieces that hopefully will bring her words to life a little bit more. And she'll do a book signing at intermission, which will push to our audiences. Uh, I've worked with Shakespeare companies, with individual actors, with narrators, uh, did a, a show for the 500th, uh, the quintessentiary of Leonardo's death, where we had uh, his artworks projected during the concert. We had uh, uh, choreography and beautiful dancers uh, bringing alive some of his little stories uh, that he wrote. Uh, and. Uh, also uh, worked with a high school, a technology high school, like kids that are planning on being engineers in college go to this high school in Indianapolis. And they made a duplicates of many of Leonardo's inventions. And we had those on display. So, you know, it brought in a huge crowd and it was incredibly fun. Kathy Turisi was our, our choreographer, uh, who was just terrific. And it was uh, so, what I'm saying to your students is uh, learn as soon as you can to work with other people, think outside the box. Uh, diversification is incredibly important on, on a number of levels. And find an audience, build the audience, stay connected to the audience, keep them aware of what you're doing, however you have to do that. A lot of it's technology based and your students are much more comfortable with that than I will ever be, but. Well, so to get uh, to get um, people taking their degree now from Juilliard or Peabody or wherever it might be, yes, I, I think thinking thinking creatively. It's obviously you've done a whole lot of that. Presumably, teaching might be part of there, or or some kind of outreach that might include teaching how to play or think about or perform early music. And maybe at the higher ed level, it seems to me there are lots of different, different kinds of ways of inserting yourself into the higher education world. And it usually starts with being hired to be the part-time Baroque flute teacher or something yeah. like that, right? I don't, know how that, I don't know how that works. I don't know how anybody breaks into that world. Sometimes it's being hired uh, part-time to, to teach like a lab, you know, teach the, the, the violinists Baroque style. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a Cincinnati Conservatory had these labs that functioned that way. A friend of mine, Rod Stuckey, taught uh, early music in, in those uh, labs. They were, they were not required classes. Well, actually, I don't know that if they might have been required for some majors, but uh, you know, it wasn't a, the main part of the student's path, but it was something that exposed them. Yeah. And I think being able 
uh, you know, to coach your students on Baroque flute, Baroque violin, but also being flexible enough and being able to work with modern players on, on, on Baroque style uh, is a really important thing. Yeah. Imagination, creativity, flexibility. I mean, those are recommendations that sound like- And, yeah. and, and improvisation. And improvisation. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah we, we had a, 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 what was it called? A, a, one of the Dean's symposiums uh, recently was called The Next Normal. And he had three panels, you know, panels of funders like from the Bloomberg and Andrew Mellon foundations, panels of uh, organizers, the director of the Sphinx organization, Kennedy Center, et cetera. And then his artist panel had some just terrific people, Marin Alsop, and especially Peter Sellers, who was just so brilliant. And, you know, he just said, Impro improvise is how we live now. That's what COVID has done to us. You know, we just have to refigure out everything. And uh, it's the way of the present and Absolutely. probably the future. And uh, I think HP and jazz are the two ends of the spectrum that can help all the people in the middle sort of free themselves up a little bit. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, you are certainly doing a great job where you are. I, I uh, wish you all future success. I mean, things, uh, the future may not look the rosiest to people right now in the world, but the good news is, and you know it as well as I do, that people keep falling in love with music. Yep. People, people keep coming to conservatories. And so the people yep. who are now studying will one day be teachers and performers and more people will come. We hope for that. We count on that. We assume that's going to happen, and I think it will. And I'll bet you believe it. I'll bet you believe. Absolutely, it. absolutely. We can't live without the arts. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Mark. I mean, for a for a for a, a bad time of the universe, it's a very cheering thing to have this conversation with you, and I'm extremely grateful to you for it. So thank you very much, Mark Sudek. Tom, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you.